Good news is good news only when it reaches the person who needs to hear it. Listen to the necessity and urgency of sharing the good news of Jesus. Why don't we all just rise up to our feet, please, and we will make our declaration and then we will uh, spend some time in God's Word. So if you brought your Bible, please hold it high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold, and strong. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you turn around to people next to you, please. Just shake hands. Give them your name. Smile. Tell them what you do. Say hello. And you may be seated, please. Thank you. This weekend, we have our weekend school on inner wholeness. It's happening at our church office. I think we've had the largest attendance so far on, uh, for any weekend school. I, I think it was 49 people attending all crammed into the church office. It was pretty good. Uh, so that's going on uh, yesterday and it's going on as well today. Uh, so during the lunch break, uh, lunchtime, I was just sitting and uh, there's one lady there. Who's, and she just said, you know, Pastor, I need to tell you something. I said, Okay. And uh, she said, it's about my eyes, about the healing for my eyes. So she had this uh, condition in her eyes and uh, where, uh, you know, she had a problem. Now, she had gone to our children's church. And some of the kids in our children's church prayed for her. And she went back to the doctor. And there was 80% improvement of her condition. Now, this is kids in our children's church. Yeah, so I was like, wow, that's something I need to tell people, you know. And uh, she, was, she was so happy at what, what had happened. And, uh, and yeah, but she's, I think this morning she's, she's at the weekend school. Um, so that was just amazing that God is working even through our children. Amen? See, uh, like you heard them say, there is no junior Holy Spirit. Right? <laughs> the same God who works through us works through the children over there. Yeah? They just have, in fact, they probably are more simple in their faith. We are the ones who are very complicated. And they just, you know, uh, step out and pray and do those things and God works through them. Uh, so it was just very encouraging to hear that and, um, and uh, just share that uh, with all of us this morning. All right. So um, please remember to pray for the short-term Bible call that is happening in Nabrangpur, uh, Orissa. It's starting tomorrow. Paul is there this, this first week. Um, uh, we have at least, I think, 60 ministers. People are working in that area who registered for that uh, short-term Bible college. Um, just pray for people because the, the travel itself is quite challenging. Uh, pray for good health. They'll be there the whole week ministering. They come back and each week, you know, uh, somebody else goes, takes, takes their turn for, and we do this for 12 weeks, for, for three months. So uh, pray for the people who are attending. Pray for those of us who are traveling to minister and come back, uh, and so on. And also this coming week, I'll be in a few different places. It'll be two days in Nagpur. We're having a pastor's conference there, ministering to about 200 pastors. Um, then uh, I go to Sholapur. Again, it's also in Maharashtra. And we're having, again, another pastor's conference for two days. And from there, we go to Kalyan. We have a church in Kalyan. So next Sunday, I'll be in Kalyan, uh, ministering in our church there. Uh, Pastor Brian will be ministering here at Central uh, so just just uh, pray for all of these things. We really appreciate you supporting us uh, in prayer as we just go around and serving people uh, across our nation. All right, this month of February, we're going to be spending uh, four Sundays uh, talking about lifestyle evangelism. E evangelism simply means to share the good news, just tell others the good news. But we want to talk about making evangelism a part of our lifestyle. 
I mean, it's just what you do on a, you know, during the week, Monday through Saturday, uh, that, that it becomes spontaneous for us. It becomes natural for us to share the good news with people around us, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to spend these, these four Sundays talking about evangelism, making evangelism a part of our lifestyle, lifestyle evangelism, and uh, uh, just encouraging us in this area. And I remember as a 13-year-old, when I, I, was, I got saved, I gave my life to Jesus just before I was 13, just before my 13th birthday. Uh, there was this fire inside me. I, I would stop anybody, any place to share about Jesus. Uh, I remember stopping people on the roadside, you know, like various places in Bangalore. Just say, I need to tell you about Jesus. I remember going through Cubbon Park. Find somebody sitting on the bench there I go and share about Jesus. I remember in my class, in my school, uh, just sharing Jesus with just anybody. Uh, I stood up in my classroom. I took permission from the, from the teacher, of course. <laughs> I stood up in my classroom and told my whole class about Jesus. I uh, took permission from uh, the principal and shared with uh, the, 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 the whole chapel, you know, the school chapel. And so. so there was this zeal. There was this passion of wanting to be a witness for Jesus. And I think many of us, when we first come to faith in Christ, we are so excited about, our, about the gospel. And uh, then I think we get a little too educated. We get so much understanding of the Bible. And uh, we get so caught up in wanting to know more and more and in all the deep things of God. And they forget that, hey, one of the reasons why you and I are here are to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Amen? And uh, we tend to lose that fire, lose that passion. And so hopefully these four Sundays, uh, and, uh, that's our prayer, that God will reignite. Of course, we can do our best from preaching and teaching from the Bible here. But I pray that God will ignite or reignite that same passion in our hearts to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. That He will just... You know, remove all of those, those inhibitors, things that hold us back, that restrain us from being a witness for Jesus. And just pointing people to Jesus uh, as Lord and Savior. Now let's turn in our Bibles to Luke, the 24th chapter. I'll read this passage from verses 36 to 49. Luke 24, 36 to 49. And uh, this morning we want to really talk about the necessity and the urgency of sharing Jesus. What is the need to do this? You know, sometimes people ask you, you, you guys, why are you so, why do you always talk about Jesus? Why are you telling others about you? What is the necessity? And for us ourselves as, as, as believers, as, as disciples of Christ, you know, what is the need for us to do this? And why is there a sense of urgency in doing this? That's what we're going to address. Let's begin by reading from Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 36 to 39. This is right after the resurrection of Jesus as he appears to his disciples. Here we read, now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you so troubled and why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to, be, and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. 
So Jesus shows himself alive to his disciples and they couldn't believe. It says they didn't believe. They're so shocked. I mean, this is the same Jesus who we saw nailed to the cross three days ago. He was nailed to the cross. We saw him dead. We saw his body taken, put in the tomb. And here he is standing before us. They couldn't believe it. It took them a while to just accept the fact that Jesus Christ is standing with in front of them. And this, these are his own disciples in this state of a shock. A shock you know? and, and, and then he, you know, he says, okay, give me something to eat. Tries to calm the, 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 the atmosphere down. It's okay, yeah, this is Jesus. He's in flesh. Yeah, he's in flesh. Yeah, he's not some ghost or something. Not our imagination at work. He is here. And then he takes them to the Old Testament scriptures, starting from Moses. So the books of Moses, they would call it the, the Torah, all the first five books of Moses. He took them to the prophets. He took them to the, uh, the, the Psalms. And, and he just said, look, all of these scriptures have been speaking about me, talking about my death and my resurrection. He gave them understanding, helped them understand uh, all of this. And then he says... It was necessary, verse 46, it was necessary for Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. And then he says, now that's been done, that's over, but there's a work ahead of us. Verse 47, repentance and remission, forgiveness of sins, needs to be preached in my name to all the nations. So that work is over, but there's a task ahead of us. Repentance, forgiveness of sins. Needs to be preached in all the nations. And then he says, you are witnesses of these things. You are the witnesses. As fearful as you may be, as trembling as you may be right now. But you are witnesses of these things. But I'm going to send the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. Who's going to empower you. You'll receive power from above to carry out this task. So now, you know. Each of us have received this commission. Though he spoke it to his initial set of disciples. What did he tell them? In Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20. He told them. He said, I'm give, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to baptize people who've made a choice, who made a decision to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So he said, go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And what? Teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. Teach them to do what I've told you to do. What did I tell you to do? I told you. That repentance and remission of sin should be preached in my name in all the nations. You are witnesses of these things. Tell the next set of disciples the same thing. So the point is this. You and I have been given the same commission. You and I are here to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Amen. We all are in different walks of life. You know, we have all kinds of people. Some of us are students. Some of us are business people. Some of us are educators. Some of us may be doctors and lawyers and uh, other kinds of professionals. Some of us are running our own businesses. Some of us are presidents and vice presidents of organizations, all of that. So we're all in different walks of life, but there's one thing we all are called to do. We are all called to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. One thing we're all going to do. We're all called to be witnesses for Jesus. You are witnesses of these things. So right where you are, in your sphere of influence, in your, in, in your world, the people that you have access to, you and I are called to witness, point people to Jesus. Now, so we're going to dwell on this. Now the message that you and I have to communicate is very simple, it's very clear. Right there in Luke 24, back in that passage, of Luke 24 verses 46 to 48, the message is clear. Christ died and he was raised from the dead the third day and there is forgiveness of sins available in his name all we have to do is repent and believe that's the message very simple Christ has died for our sins he's been raised from the dead the third day and there is forgiveness of sins available to every person and all we need to do is repent and believe and that's the message 
we are called to share with people. Amen? Now, as we build on this, let's answer the two questions. What is the need to do this? Why is there a necessity? Why should you and I go and share the good news of Jesus with other people? Why do we need to be witnesses for Jesus? Why do we need to point people to Jesus Christ? First one. And the second is, why is there a sense of urgency? Why can't I postpone it to do after retirement? You know, now I'm busy. I'm going to focus on my profession. I'm going to focus on, you know, whatever I'm doing right now. You know, once I finish everything, if I have some spare time, I'll do it. No. Why is there an urgency for this whole thing? I'm going to answer these two questions. And I'm going to just share from Scripture. You know, why? What does the Bible tell us? Uh, why, uh, why should we share the good news of Jesus? And why do we, why is there a sense of urgency to this? Number Three reasons. Number one, for the first part, people need a Savior. And there is only one. Now, that's tough for many of us to accept. You know, in a society where, you know, we need to be accepting of everybody. And, you know, we, you need to be right. Don't offend anybody. For us as believers, as uh, disciples of Jesus, to tell, look, you know, the Bible says there is only one way. Can be so offensive to people. It's like, what's wrong with you? You know, shouldn't there be more ways to God? Shouldn't there be multiple ways to access creator God? Why are you saying there's only one way? Why does the Bible say there is only one way? Why? Now, you and I understand this, that the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned. Every person has sinned. We've sinned. We've, we've all done wrong. And our sins have, ha have its consequences because God's a holy God. God's perfectly holy. And our sins have separated us from God. Regardless of our background or education, whatever, we are people who are sinned against God. We're separated from God. And our sins have additional consequences. They have, uh, uh, they, they prevent us from getting to God. And the Bible says that the result of sin is, that means we're all, by default, because of our sin, heading to an eternal place of separation from God in hell. Now, we cannot reach God ourselves because we are unrighteous. Our best actions are like filthy rags in the eyes of God, the Bible says. That no matter what we do, religion cannot get us to God. Our good works cannot get us to God. Our penance or our sacrifices or our offerings, uh, none of these things can get us to God. And so what does the Bible say? The Bible says God reaches out to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God reaches out to us. And he says, what you couldn't do for yourself, I'm going to do. And Christ comes into this world and he dies for the sins of the whole world. Now, why, what makes Christ so unique? Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose up again. He showed himself alive. Uh, there's, that's, his resurrection is indisputable when you have 500 eyewitnesses to his resurrection standing in a court of law. And he made himself alive. And then he, he gave us this commission to go preach the gospel. And he's in heaven. So now, what makes Christ so unique? No other man or woman who ever lived, as good as they may have been, as wonderful as they may, may have been as religious leaders, every man born of a woman was born in sin. Which means he's got his own sins to die for. And therefore he could not in any way be a substitute for the rest of the world. Only God who became a man who was sinless could now be a substitute for the rest of us. So it makes complete sense. That when he was put on the cross, he could bear the sins of the world because he himself was sinless. Amen? It makes Christ unique. It makes him different. And that's why the Bible is so emphatic. It's so clear. And I'll read these verses for you. Acts 4 and verse 12. Peter is preaching. He says, and there is salvation in no, and neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So that's the message of the Bible. There is one way. It's Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 and 6. For there is one God 
and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So that's the message of the Bible. is one God, one mediator. So people need a savior and there is only one. You all with me so far? Now, if just imagine there's somebody with a deadly disease and there was only one cure for that disease and you knew of that cure, what would you want to do? Tell them. Tell them. And so, in a similar way, each one of us and the world around us, the people around us, we need a Savior. And the Bible says there's only one. It's Jesus Christ. And there's a valid reason why he's the only one. The second reason why there is this necessity to sharing the gospel is that because people are empty, are hurting, are searching, are in need. And we have someone who can meet all of this. Now, when we look around us, we find all kinds of people. Some of our friends may be very affluent. They've got everything. All the money, very successful, high accomplishments, done a lot. But yet, even within the hearts of such people, there is a need. People are looking for meaning. They want to know the truth. They want to know why are we here. What is the purpose of life? What is it that can give me fulfillment? I mean, I have all of this, but inside I want to be fulfilled. I want to know that my life has meaning more than all of this. Do you agree with me? Even if people have everything, they still have an inner search. Something they're searching for on the inside. And then, of course, we have other kinds of people. There are people who are hurting, who are broken, uh, who are struggling, who are poor. Or have all other kinds of needs in their lives. And all of us are searching. Regardless of you know, what our position or status or, or, or situation in life is, we are all searching. Whether we are the, the ones who are very affluent or we are the ones who are very poor. Whether we are educated or whether we are uneducated. Whether we are very rich or poor or whatever our position in society is, we are all searching. And sometimes we go searching down the wrong path. The Bible tells us there in Proverbs 14 verse 12, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So many of us are searching. We go searching down the wrong path. We think it's the right, but we don't know the ends. The end are the ways of death. So people are searching. There, there is an emptiness. There is something they want. And here's what Jesus said in John 10 verse 10. You and I are familiar with this verse. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life. And have it in all its fullness. Have it in abundance. So Jesus came to give us life. That word there talks about the God kind of life. Not just the natural life. He's saying, I've come to give you the God kind of so when people around us have needs, I think it's just the right thing to do is to point them to someone who can meet that. The searching inside, the questions, the hurts, the pains, the whatever. Here is somebody who can give you life, the God kind of life, which can address all your needs. Point them to Jesus. People are searching for truth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way. The truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, sometimes you and I are under pressure. The pressure of customer satisfaction. Right? I mean, those of us, we understand what that means, right? You know, in our, wherever we are working, we got to satisfy our customers. And especially if you're in the sales, business, business development side. Hey, you want to make sure the promises you make to your customers are met. Right? You don't want to make promises and then the rest of your organization d disappoints them. And you're going to have unsatisfied customers. So we're under that pressure. Like, what if I tell somebody that Jesus can meet their need and hope it happens? <laughs> Listen, that pressure should not be on you and me. 
Jesus is the life. He is the truth. He is the way. We are only pointers. We are only signposts. When people encounter Jesus, he will not fail them. He is sure to meet their needs. He is life. So our confidence should be in him. Lord, I know if I introduce people to you and I point them to you, you will take care of them. You will not fail them. Amen? So just believe in whom? Him and what he can do for them. It's our, we are only witnesses. We are only going to point people to Jesus. But he will meet their needs. So that pressure is not on you and me. He will take care of them. He's not going to fail them. The last third reason, the last reason here about the necessity is because people will not know the truth unless someone tells them. You see, good news is not good news until the person who needs it hears it. So you imagine a person in prison under a life sentence, he's there, but the president decides to absolve all him of all his, you know, wrong, his crime. It's okay. There's a presidential pardon announced for him. Now he could be sitting in prison, but if that news of the presidential pardon does not reach him, it's not good news for him. That when the news reaches him, that's good news. It's only then that he can walk out of the prison. Are you with me? So good news is not good news until it reaches the person who needs to hear it. Paul brings it out in Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 8 to 15. He says, what does it say? The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man, one believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the message is where salvation is so simple in the Bible. If you believe in your heart and you acknowledge Jesus as, with, as Lord with your mouth, you will be saved. And then he continues, he says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So this is accessible for every person, anyone, whoever, anyone who believes will not be put to shame. This is accessible for everybody. And then he says in verse 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. See, God does not make a distinction between your culture, your race, your ethnicity, or your Jew, your Greek. No, there is no distinction. The same God is rich to all who call upon him. Doesn't matter what your background is. He's rich to everybody. He's willing to respond to anyone who calls on him. And then he tells us in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But here's the problem, verse 14. How shall they call on him? In whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's the issue. God is ready. God is available. Salvation is accessible for every person. And God is rich to everyone who calls on him. He makes no distinction. But the problem is, how can they call on somebody whom they have not believed? And how can they believe if they haven't heard? And how can they hear unless somebody tells them? And that somebody could be you. To the people around you. As you just have to tell them about Jesus. Hey, he died for you. Repentance and remission of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. That somebody could be you. Now, I know that we live in a world where people are very skeptical, even of good news. Right? I mean, anything. You, people are now very skeptical. How do you know it's sure? You read something on the in internet, you've got to ask, is this real or not? Because you don't know whether the information that you are being presented with, whether it's on television, on the internet, or some other media, 
You don't know whether it's right or wrong. You know, uh, Amy showed me this video a couple of weeks ago. And this happened in London in December 2017. It's the shed in Dulwich. Okay, here's this guy. I mean, he's a young fellow. I'm not saying enough of us should try this out, but he created a spoof restaurant, a restaurant that didn't exist. It was called The Shed in Dulwich. And then, and of course, he was, he was doing this for Vice magazine. This guy's name was, uh, he was a journalist, Oba Butler. And he, he created this website about a restaurant which didn't exist. And he got his people to uh, give high ratings on TripAdvisor. And I think in a, he managed this in about six months or so. It became the number one rated restaurant in London. <laughs> They had not served a single meal. It didn't exist. But number one rated. People were calling. And, and, and he had this trick. You can come only by appointment. So people were calling. Celebrities were calling. He would answer, sorry, we're only full. And it became the number one rated restaurant in London. Until he just felt bad about the dirty trick he played. So finally, he called a few people back. He called some celebrities back and said, yeah, we've got some. And so the only meal they served, they said for, served for nine people, including a couple that came all the way from California. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was really funny. And then he brought the whole story out. But the point was this, that, you know, using technology and all that happens today, you can do anything almost. Yeah, this restaurant didn't exist, but it became number one. All right. With all the ratings that he put up there. And this is true. It happened December 2017. So there is this natural tendency among people these days. And most of us are like that. We question and you hear something or we read something, we watch something. Is it true? Because we know that people could have their own bias to the whole story, uh, to the what is, what is communicated. We know that. And so we will face this kind of skepticism even when we talk about Jesus. It's just normal. So don't let that put you off. The truth will prevail. The message of Jesus Christ will have its impact. And we've got stories and stories of people who maybe the first time they heard about Jesus, they said, don't talk to me about it anymore. But then God met them at another point, and at another point, and another point, somebody else more. And maybe they, they, they heard it five times, and you may be the fourth person in that whole sequence of, of people pointing them to Jesus. But you're number four, and that's important. Because maybe the fifth person who points them to Jesus the truth will penetrate. The hearts will be open. And they will encounter the living, risen Christ. So the, what I want to say is this, that even though you may face this kind of a reaction, a very skeptical response to you pointing people to Jesus, don't give up. It's just normal. It's just natural. The truth will penetrate their hearts. Just be kind, be loving, point them to Jesus, and let him touch their lives. So let's close by talking about the urgency. Why, why is there this urgency? Why should I do it now? Why, do, why should I not postpone it to some, some other day? Why should I find and be alert and be aware of opportunities to witness for Jesus wherever I am? Just two reasons. One, people are perishing. They don't know it. And that's a hard statement to make. But that's what the Bible says. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, he says, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. See, if we hide the gospel, we hide the message of Jesus, it's being held back from those who are perishing. And what's worse is the God of this world has blinded their minds. He tries to do everything he can to prevent the gospel from touching their minds and hearts. So this is urgent. Think about this. Every time a person leaves this world, dies and leaves this world, it's the end of their opportunity to hear the gospel. It's the end of their opportunity to respond to the message of Jesus Christ. There is no second chance or third chance or fifth chance. 
There are no intermediate stops on the way after they leave this world. The Bible is clear. Hebrews 9 verse 27. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die. After that, the judgment. So there is no second chance, no third chance. And so there is that urgency, the need to bring the message of Jesus Christ to people right here, right now. Number two, time is running out. Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 14, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So you go back in time. To Jerusalem. Right from there. They had to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. 2,000 years have come and gone. The gospel has reached all the nations. We're not saying all individuals. We're saying all the nations. It's gone everywhere. There's probably no nation on the earth. That the gospel is not accessible. Whether you're in North Korea. The gospel has gone in. You're in China. They're probably the largest Christian community of believers. But they're underground. But they're there. You go to Russia or go to any other Eastern Europe former, you know, communist nations. The gospel's gone in. Anywhere. The gospel is accessible. I'm not saying it has reached every person. But it's available in all nations of the earth. Everywhere. So we are really close to the end. Jesus said this gospel will be preached as a witness in all nations. Then the end will come. We are very close to the end. So now the challenge is the last mile. That the gospel should reach the individual. The people that need to hear it. They need to hear it. And you and I need to take it. You know the old time preachers used to preach like this. Of course... You know, modern times have become more sophisticated. But the old days, they used to say it very straight and plain. Heaven is very real. Hell is too hot. Life is too short. Eternity is too long for me not to tell you the truth. Okay, now we modern preachers have become a little polished. And, you know, we don't want to offend anybody. But hey, the old time gospel preachers just told it like it is. They said it. The way they... And just straight. Now imagine if somebody's drowning in the middle of a lake, somebody's drowning, there's somebody on the lakeside who's got, you know, maybe a life jacket, who's got a rope, he's got the means to rescue the person who's drowning. And this person standing on the lakeside just stands and watches. That would be ridiculous. Unacceptable. He's at least got to try, he's at least got to do something. Throw the lifeline out, throw the life jacket out. If you know how to swim, jump in, try to do something. And that's the challenge I want to put out to you and me. Point people to Jesus. We're not trying to be rude. Don't be obnoxious. Don't, you know, hurt people. That's, that's not the point. The point is, look, if you have a need, I can point you to a savior. I can point you to somebody who can meet that need. Who said he is the way, the truth, and the life. And there are countless lives all over the globe from all cultures, all races, all kinds of backgrounds who can attest to the fact that Jesus Christ has made a difference in their lives. Close with a few, maybe a couple of more verses here. In James 5, verses 19 to 20, James says, Brethren, and if any of you wanders from the truth and someone turns his back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. He who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death. Now think about this. Everything we do here on earth, we cannot take with us to eternity. I'm not saying quit your jobs or don't go to work. I'm just saying think about the reality. We're going to leave these things behind. But when you touch a soul, you need to touch a person, causing him to come to faith in Christ and have experienced salvation. When you touch a soul, that's something done 
for eternity. Or when you help in the whole process of touching souls, you're doing something for eternity. You will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of Something that will last. That soul is going to worship God and be thankful because somebody cared to tell them about Jesus Christ. So let us, let us not be ashamed of the gospel. Paul put it, this like, put it like this, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. So don't be ashamed. Talk about Jesus because that message, the good news, is the power of God that brings salvation to every person. Let's take on the responsibility. Paul said, if I preach the gospel in 1 Corinthians 9.16, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about. For necessity is laid upon me. It's something I have to do. But woe is me. If I do not preach the gospel. So I say, look, if I tell people about Jesus, I can't boast about it. That's something I have to do. It's necessity. I have to do it. But I'm miserable if I don't. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Let's take up our responsibility to be witnesses for Jesus. Now in the coming weeks, next week, Pastor Brian will be here. He'll talk about overcoming inhibitions. Many of us... We have some things that hold us back. We are a little reluctant, afraid, shy. Oh, we have all kinds of things that inhibit us from sharing the message of Jesus. Then the following week, we'll talk about simple strategies. How do we make evangelism our lifestyle? How do we do this very, in a very simple way? And finally, we close off by talking about nurturing and discipling people. How do we do that? So that's what we're going to do in the coming weeks. But this morning... On simple challenge, you and I are witnesses for Jesus. Point people to Jesus. Talk about him. You don't need to be very sophisticated. Just tell people that he died for their sins. He rose up from the dead. He can forgive their sins. He can meet their need. He came to give us life and life in abundance. He came us to bring, came to bring us into that relationship with God. He can make a difference in our lives. Let people explore him. Let people try him. Be a witness for Jesus. Amen. I want to close with this, uh, just one little announcement here. On the 16th of February, uh, we're doing a little outreach in Malaysia. Um, we're doing a prayer service. We're just going to invite people in, in that community to come for prayer. So Friday, the 16th of February, we rented a hall there in Malaysia. Uh, we're just going to invite people in, all the, just in the neighborhood all over there to come for prayer. 6.30 p.m. Friday, 16th of February, 6.30 p.m. I'm just going to pray for people. Just pray for their needs. And um, as people experience God touching their lives, they, they, their hearts are going to be open. So if you want to come and be a part of it, you're welcome to do that. Friday, 16th of February, 6.30 p.m., Malaysia. We just need people to help various ways. You can pray for people. You can help with just guiding people for prayer. Uh, you know, taking care of some of the things that need, need to be done. So you could be there. Friday, 16th of February, 6.30 p.m., at GM Rejoice uh, Auditorium uh, in Malaysia. If you want to just call the church office, they'll tell you where the auditorium is. Uh, and then if you can't make it, that's okay. Just pray for that outreach. Pray for that prayer service Friday, 16th February, uh, 6.30 p.m. at Malaysia. Pray that God will touch the lives of people as they come to receive prayer in Jesus' name. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. We're going to just close here. So we take a moment before we close just to pray and say, God, help me to be a witness for Jesus. Just pray in your own heart. If maybe, Jerry, if you could just come and play the keyboards, please. I don't know where you guys are, but somewhere. Okay. Um, just pray. Say, Lord, help me be a witness for Jesus. A simple prayer. Right where you've placed me. With people that I'm connected to. People that I interact with. Help me to be a witness for Jesus. Help me to point people to Jesus Christ. The one who said, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. 
Father, I just pray over each of us here, God. We thank you that we have experienced what you can do in our lives. But now, God, help us pass that on. I ask for the empowering of your Holy Spirit upon each of us. Holy Spirit, ignite a fire in our hearts. A passion. A, a fire inside of us. That we will point people to Jesus Christ. That we will be witnesses of Jesus Christ. That we will share the gospel with people around us, God. Help us to do that in, in simple ways, in loving ways, in gentle ways, in meaningful ways to touch lives for Jesus. Before we close this morning, if there's anyone here, as part of this message, you heard me share why Jesus Christ is important. You heard me share the claims of Christ. He came to give us life and life in abundance. He came, as he said, he is the way, the truth, the life. And you feel something in your heart. that Yes, I want Jesus in my life. And if you've never done this before, if you've never asked Jesus to touch you, make you a new person, to forgive your sins, to make you a child of God. If you've never done this before, but you would like to do it this morning, and I want to lead you in a simple prayer. And right where you are, you can pray this with me. Those of you watching online, if you have people in your homes, family members or watching, if you've never done this before, and you right where you are in your home, in your living room, or wherever you're watching, if you want to do this. I would just encourage you, invite you to pray this prayer with me. Just say this with me, Lord Jesus. I believe you died for my sins. That you were buried and that you rose up again. I receive the forgiveness of sins through your name. Give me your life the God kind of life. Make me a child of God and help me follow you the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time this morning. If you don't mind, would you raise your hand? We just want to celebrate with you. This is not to embarrass anybody, but if you prayed this prayer with me the very first time this morning, if you don't mind, just raise your hand. Anyone here? this auditorium downstairs we say have one hand just put your hand up like one hand God bless you anybody else anybody else up on the balcony anybody else anybody else okay so we have a bag that we just usually give anyone who's made that prayed that prayer for the first time it's our gift to you it has free resources in it it has a new testament in it please take that with you along with that there's a card you just write your name and number just hand it back to that person who's standing next to you it'll help us be in touch with you we'll guide you what to do next also, in case you didn't raise your hand, you're feeling a little embarrassed, that's not a problem. On the way out, on all our exits, our greeters will be there waiting with this green bag. You can just ask them for it. They'll give it to you. Just write your name on the card, and we will contact you just to help you grow in your faith in Jesus. Let's close. As soon as we close, I will be heading out to the swimming pool, so I will not be here to pray, so please excuse uh, we'll be heading out to the swimming pool. Those who want to join us can join us at the swimming pool for the water baptism. Let's close in prayer. Please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go be a witness for Jesus. God bless you. See you again. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at abcwo.org. Also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.